Welcome to Lessons for the Journey. Lessons for the Journey is the teaching ministry of Dr. David Clifton. These lessons from Scripture are designed to aid in the journey of faith and the journey of life. Let's open our Bibles and join today's lesson. I believe I've mentioned to you before that many, of, if not most things in life, are temporary. They last for a time and then they fade away. And an end of one of the seasons in our lives has come. We have walked together for a season. And the next time I speak, it will be in front of a different congregation, and I will be their pastor instead. So it means a change in our relationship, but not only that, shortly there's going to be a change in all your relationships. You won't be church members together anymore. So if you've got to figure out, where does God want you? What does he want you to do? And we've been talking about that in my messages and in what we've been talking about in the Bible study in the mornings. And I've been pondering for some weeks now, what should be my final sermon? What should my final words to you as pastor sound like? More importantly, Brenda cut that out. More importantly, what would the Holy Spirit have me leave you with? So today's message is entitled, The Changing of Seasons. And, of course, probably what comes to mind, I told you to bring your Bibles today, because all you get are references. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, everybody knows that. Shoot, there was a song back in the 60s that used those words. (laughs) Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. The writer says, There is an appointed time for everything and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So we know that the writer was Hebrew because they loved to give you contrasts and he did so many of them. And as with so many things, we've come to a time of change for all of us at New Journey. The writer of Ecclesiastes, if you read, he was very humanistic and very almost pessimistic in his writings. Why was that? Because if you read what he wrote, he was writing about a life under the sun. And all of the important concerns in life are above the sun. So he was looking at everything purely humanistic. And that's why everything was just so doom and gloom in what he had to say. So I don't want you to consider Ecclesiastes. I felt like I had to go there because it's where everybody's mind went. But we're we're done. We're, we're, We're leaving now. Because I want you to consider rather life with the sun or the life that the sun has for us and not life under the sun. And I thought perhaps on this occasion it would be good to uh, delve into something that Paul wrote. Perhaps there was something to be gained by looking at the ends of his epistles because he wrote letters and wrote final greetings to a bunch of people. And now the Gospels, they certainly contain some of the most important of the New Testament writings. And the way the New Testament is put together, the Gospels come first, right? 
So we automatically, we automatically assume the Gospels came first. Well, most New Testament scholars agree that Mark was written between 60 to 75 A.D. Matthew was written between 65 and 85. Luke was written between 65 and 95. And John was written between 75 and 90 A.D. However, as early as 50 A.D., which predates everybody, there was this fellow called Paul who began life as really a nobody, as somebody that persecuted the church, and then the Lord got hold of him and changed him a little bit. So at least 10 years before Mark started writing the first gospel, Paul was already writing letters to churches, to groups of believers, that became half of the New Testament. Right at half. So Paul was writing before anybody else. And you would think that when they, they put the New Testament together, they'd put all Paul's writings in order, right? Nah. No, it shouldn't be that easy. So let's examine Paul, what he wrote, who he wrote it to, and in what order he wrote it to. Now, I'm not going to sit here and belabor. This is not a New Testament survey class. I'm not going to give you the dates on all these epistles. But we are going to look at them in the order they were written. So, with that said, let's go first to 1 Thessalonians. That was the first letter he wrote. 1 Thessalonians. We're going to go to verse 5. In this case, I'm going to look at way too much. Verses 1 through 28. We'll look at the first 11 verses first. So Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, a city that still exists, by the way. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman who is pregnant, and they will never escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Verse 9, For God has not appointed us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him, Therefore, comfort one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. So Paul's primary concern in this case was to address some fears that he had heard that they had. They had gotten some bad information about the day of the Lord, and they thought they'd missed it. And it's interesting because in chapter 5, the first thing he says is, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Why? Because either there's some teaching, clear teaching in Scripture about what is what, or Paul had taught them something or written them previously, of which we have absolutely no record, so that they would know and they wouldn't have to wonder about that question. But what does he relate it to? Concerning the times and the seasons, you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So he's associating everything to the, with the day of the Lord. So don't be confused when people, you guys, don't be confused. When people are talking about the day of the Lord and all of a sudden the day of the Lord becomes seven years worth of stuff. That's not what scripture teaches. Same thing Paul was saying to them. His primary was con concern was to address their fears of the day of the Lord. He reminded them of his previous teaching and he reminded them what scripture itself said. But he belabors that for 11 verses and then he turns his concern to other matters. Matters of their attitudes on various matters. I know I'm using matters a lot, but... 
Verse 12, he said, But we ask of you, brothers, that you know those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but examine all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. There's a lot of stuff packed in there. But I want you to notice first, but brothers, we ask of you that you know those who labor among you. Well, don't you all know everybody in this church? So what does he mean? It means to regard with favor. Not just, yeah, I know who they are, but I know them well enough to, to regard them with favor in the Lord because of what they do. And then he tells them what God's will is. And everything give thanks for well, this is God's will. But Lord, I just wrecked my car. And everything give thanks. You don't know why the Lord had you wreck your car. Maybe he wanted you to have a new one. <laughs> and that's his way of doing it. I don't know. We don't know, but we look at doom and gloom and we think, no, let's, let's confess, if God is good, why is this going on? And then a little while later, hopefully, not always, we found out, oh, that's why this is going on, because I'm so much better off than I was before this went on, or I have learned so much more about the Lord and how he takes care of things than I knew before these things went on. Examine all things and hold on to what's good. Get rid of the rest. Abstain from every form of evil. That's important in this culture, let me tell you. It was important when Paul was writing. It's just as important now, unfortunately. And finally, we come to his benediction, beginning in verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. You know, we've been talking about a lot lately about everyone having a spiritual gift, and if you have a spiritual gift, then there are things that God ha is expecting you to do with it. I know you don't like to use this word for yourself. It's okay for a pastor to be called, but I'm not called to do anything. I'm sorry, is right there. Faithful is he. Paul wasn't writing to, this isn't one of the pastoral epistles. He wasn't writing to Timothy or Titus. He was writing to just average Joe church members. Okay? Faithful is he who calls you that's all y'all, okay, to put it that way. He also will do it. See, that's part of our problem. We think we got to do stuff. No, we just got to be willing to get out of God's way and let him do it through us. But he said in verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. Do you know what sanctify is? Yes, that's some of that charismatic stuff. We don't want any part of that stuff. Sanctify. It's just preparing you for God's use. It is progressing you towards Christ-likeness. There is a fine, upstanding doctrine called progressive sanctification. If we're doing what we're supposed to be doing in the Christian life, we're going to be better tomorrow than we were today. And hopefully by now we're whole, so much better than we were when we first became a believer. Okay? Don't get me wrong. Even Paul said, I'm not there yet. But, I'm getting there. That's how we ought to progress. That's how we ought to be sanctified. Bit by bit by bit. So that's what, how he ended the first letter. Interestingly, the second letter he wrote was the second letter to the Thessalonians. So just move over a few chapters. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And he changes his tone a little bit for the second letter. He starts with a prayer request. One that I can... Ask for myself, actually. 
And then with a commendation. He began this chapter 3 by saying, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of God will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you, and that we may that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful who will strengthen and guard you from the evil one, and have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Just keep doing the right thing. Some of you have sent me emails. How am I going to know what's the right church? And I've used this example a few different times. If you walk into a store to buy a new pair of shoes, you don't necessarily buy the first pair you try on. Sometimes you've got to try out a few pairs before they fit. When Laurie and I were looking for a place before we came here, there were a lot of Sunday mornings that we would go sit down in a church and it didn't take 10 minutes and we looked at each other and said, well, we wasted this Sunday morning because this isn't it. You're going to find some of those. But when you get to where God wants you to be for the next place, it's going to be as comfortable as an old shoe. Your favorite shoes or your favorite pair of jeans once you get them broken in good. You know? It's going to be like that. And you're going to find a place where the gifts and talents and calling that you have are going to fit right in. Don't go just for what you get out of it. Go also for what you can give to it. Remember that. So the prayer request. Pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified. In other words, Paul, Paul asked in another place that he would have the open opportunities to spread the, spread the word. And then a command because some, apparently there had been some troubles that had arisen in the church. And so he's saying, the Lord's faithful to strengthen and guard you from the evil one, one that comes in trying to sow discord or whatever. And so the command next, particularly, it seems like some were trying to live off the church. You know, because in, the, in Acts it talks about the church took care of the needs of whoever and anybody that needed something, they took care of it. Paul says in verse 6 here, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from ever, every brother who walks in an unruly manner and not according to the traditions which they received from us. Traditions are the instruction that the apostles gave. They're not just traditions like, oh yeah, every Christmas Eve we do this, that, and the other. You know, it used to be the tradition in my family because my birthday's so close to Christmas. The tradition was every year on my birthday the Christmas tree went up. That's tradition. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about the teaching of doctrine and so forth. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. Paul said, I'll look at what I'm doing if you're wondering what you're supposed to do. Because we did not act in an unruly manner among you, nor we, did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working day and night so that we not, would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the authority, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would imitate us. For even when we were with you, we used to command this to you. If anyone is not willing to work, neither let him eat. I, re I knew the scripture was in my message today when we were in the first hour talking about laziness. You know? Isn't it interesting how God works, makes those things go? You know? Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus that working with quietness, they eat their own bread. But as for you, brothers, those of you that are doing the right thing, don't lose heart in doing good. I keep doing the right thing, and these people are just evil as can be, and they prosper, and Lord, how long is that going to be? That's okay. The day will come when it all comes out. And then he gives an admonition instruction to the church and to those individuals in the church verse 14 if anyone does not obey our word in this letter let special note of that person or sorry take special note of that person to not associate with him so that he'll be put to shame and do not yet and even yet don't regard him as an enemy but admonish him as a brother you're trying to pull him back get him back where he's supposed to be and now we get to his benediction for the second letter to them 
Now may the peace of the Lord himself continually give you peace in every circumstance. That is so hard. You want to go, hey, that's easy for you to say, Paul. You think he didn't have some hard times? Hey, if you read his letters, you can see he had some hard times. He wasn't at peace in every circumstance. So he's saying, in this case, do as I say do, not as I do. Peace in every circumstance. Look to the Lord for it. The Lord be with you all, he says. And he says, the greeting is in my own hand, Paul. Most scholars believe that Paul, the thorn in the flesh that he had was bad eyes. And that he had to write huge so that you could see him. So once he took the pen away from whoever was operating as secretary, all of a sudden the letters became real big so Paul could see enough what he was doing. And see, this is in my own hand. That way you know it's me, really, in some places. Peace in every circumstances was how, how he finished with them. He wrote two letters to them that we have. And as much as it would be advantageous to examine each epistle, it's getting way too close to time already. So we can't do that. But I'm going to stay in chronological order. I'm just going to skip some. So once again, Paul finds it necessary. He did it the same thing in 1 Corinthians, but I'm, not, I'm going to skip over 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul had to write them some serious instructions in, in the 1 Corinthians. Well, we're back here in 2 Corinthians now, and he had to do the same thing. So we're going to be, begin in verse 5 this time. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you failed the test? He's getting pretty strong, isn't he? Hey, test yourselves. Make sure you're in the faith. <coughs> How many church members are there in this country? We won't even think about the whole world. Shoot, how many church members are there in this county? I said church members. Okay, They may have showed up this morning, wherever they are. But if they were to really test themselves, to try themselves, to examine themselves, to use what Paul says here, would they find that they're in the faith or not if they were really truthful to themselves? Or do you not recognize about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? In which case you would have failed the test. But I hope that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Paul says, I hope you see in me that I haven't failed that test. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. In other words, Paul saying, it's not about me. You do what you need to do because it's the right thing to do. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for, that you be restored. For this reason, I am writing these things while absent, so that when present, I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me, for building up and not for tearing down. In other words, Paul said, get yourself straight because I don't want to have to talk to you ugly when I get there. That's the Clifton version, okay? Clifton translation. That's basically what he's saying. Handle these problems that are coming up in your church because if you don't, when I get there, I will. But I don't want to have to do that, is what he's saying. Verse 11, finally, brothers, rejoice be restored, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. Holy kiss was like a handshake, okay? Don't get all, you know, run, running off of that. He was concerned that among everything that was going on, make sure your doctrine is right to all the churches. If you're handling things right and living the way they ought to be, there's going to be a certain peace that is about you, even in the midst of turmoil. Yes, you will have issues you're going to have to deal with, but there's going to be a certain kind of peace about you that the world around you is going to look at them and say, what is wrong with those people? The world is falling down around them, and they seem to be not, you know, pretty much okay with it. That was his tone with them. So now let's look at Philippians, because... Paul uses a completely different tone with the church in Philippi than he did with the church in Corinth. 
chapter 4, beginning in verse 8 this time. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, consider these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace be with you. There's that peace thing again. A theme that continues in his teaching. Verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Now at last you have revived thinking about me. Indeed, you were thinking about me before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in abundance. In any and all things, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of both having abundance and suffering need. So they hadn't given to him, hadn't donated to the ministry, his ministry in a while, and he sent a gift, and he's commenting about that. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 14, nevertheless, you have done well to fellowship with me in my affliction. Lori's friend has a shirt. She came back from dinner with her one time, told me about it, and I couldn't not bring it up in this case. It says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Because that's what this is. And unfortunately, we can blame it on the King James Version. Because a lot of the modern versions we have today, some of them, now I can't say a lot, some of the versions we have today didn't go back to Greek and Hebrew. They just modernized the King James and, and changed it up and did this, and maybe a little bit of scholarship to go with it. But... The King James Version in verse says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Christ which strengtheneth me. Most of your modern translations, your better modern translations, say I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Good bit of difference in those two. But unfortunately, even when we read it in the new translations, our mind still goes back to the King James. Those of us that are of a certain age that grew up mostly with the King James. It's not the idea of him being around that gives me strength. Okay? I can do all things because Christ is with me, helping me out, and guiding me along with all these things. No. That's not the idea of the verse. You want to know what the idea of the verse is? So many times the Bible is its own best commentary. Now, you won't remember. I won't ask you to remember. You'll remember when you hear me read it. But if you look at John 15, 5, Jesus gave us the own best commentary on what Paul had to say here. John 15, 5, the Lord says, I am the vine. Now you know it, don't you? I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I can do all things? No. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. So it's all got to come from Him. It's not our own strength that God, Christ somehow uses. Okay. Scripture talks about in so many places about before we come we're dead in trespasses and sin. When have you ever seen a dead man do anything? <laughs> they don't. Okay. So moving along, Galatians is where we're going to find up next. Now you guys do know, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you, that Galatia was not a city, it was a region. Okay? Like a state. So there were several churches in Galatia. And apparently they needed instruction in congregational care and in respect for their spiritual leaders. Because Paul starts out in verse 1 of chapter 6. Brothers, even if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each of you looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. You know, it's often been said that the Christian the army is the only one that shoots its own wounded. Somebody in church makes a really bad decision. 
They're saved. They're, they're truly a believer. But in a moment of weakness, they made a really bad decision. Great. Let's kick them while they're down. No, I'm not really gossiping. I'm giving you a prayer request. <laughs> we shoot our own wounded. What did Paul say to do? If, anyone's caught in, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. So is the problem we don't have any spiritual ones in our congregations to restore such a one? If you really look into who that spiritual is, it better be any believer helping to restore one in a spirit of gentleness, knowing that, as the saying goes, but for the grace of God, there goes me, knowing that. But what else did he tell us? Because that's just one verse. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Help them out. I got enough stuff of my own. Yeah, but maybe if you help them and they help you, you know, it all comes out. If anyone thinks himself something when he is nothing, he dece deceives himself. And each one must examine his own work. And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. Well, wait a minute, Paul. Didn't you just tell me to help bear somebody else's burdens? Yeah, it sounds a little confusing. But we have to take our own responsibility. But in that responsibility, we take responsibility for helping others that are around us. And here's one of the passages where Paul, very similar to something he was saying before, but even a little more so, in verse 6. The one who is instructed in the word is to share in all good things with the one who instructs him. Some churches think they shouldn't pay their pastor. Fortunately, you folks are not one of them. Okay? You've been very good to us over the years. All right. Do not be deceived. Here it is. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this he will also reap. How many of y'all do a little bit of gardening? You know, at least, you know, I got a flower pot that I put pepper plants in. I mean, that, that's close enough. When you plant the seed, you don't go out and harvest it the next day, do you? And so it is with our actions. Sometimes they may go on for a while. But then the crop is going to come in and oh me, depending on what we sowed. So we need to be careful what we're doing because that is an issue of consequences. There are consequences to our actions. If we mess up, Will God forgive us? Absolutely. When we confess and repent, he forgives us. That does not mean he erases consequences. Not necessarily so. I only think one or two times in my life when I did something, and I think what I did in that case was I beat myself up bad enough that the Lord said, all right, boy, I'll give you some slack this time. <laughs> but we don't normally. <clears throat> And so he's talking about that. And when we come to verse 11, he took the pen from the secretary again. He said, see with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. As many as are wanting to make a good showing in the flesh, these are trying to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. People were saying, oh, you can't be a true follower of Christ unless you're, you go the whole Jewish route and be circumcised and all this. The apostles in Jerusalem had already decided, no, Gentiles don't need to be circumcised to be believers. They're trying to bring this legalism in. You know, it's his, pick one. You know, what, whatever is the hot, hot topic that, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. And the other flip side of that is you've got a whole culture going crazy and those that are adhering to the word are now being, oh, you're just being legalistic. No, I'm following what the word says. You're being list, legalistic when you take. Uh, let's okay. When when I was in the in the uh, culture where I grew up, you didn't go to movies. Good Christian people didn't go to movies. And even if it was a good movie, you didn't go because if you were supported a good movie, you supported the uh, that that they used that money to make the bad movies. So you didn't go to see a movie. Okay. So if you want to keep, you want to follow that, at that time, Paramount Studios, at one point it was owned by Gulf. So then, therefore, you can't buy Gulf gasoline because that helps. You follow? And at another time, it was owned by Coca-Cola. 
So if you're not going to support movies, you can't drink. Do you see how crazy this gets if you keep going on and on? That's the kind of thing Paul was talking about. We can't keep adding these things. Look to what Christ himself has said and go with that. In verse 15, For neither is circumcision anything or uncircumcision, but a new creation. And from now on, verse 17, let no one cause trouble for me because I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. He had beatings because he was a Christian. And then what does he say? In verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. So be it. I'm getting there. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. We've got a commendation to prayer and Christian conduct here. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak the mystery of Christ for which I have also been bound, that I may make it manifest in the way I ought to speak. See, that's the one I was talking about with Paul earlier. He's asking for the opportunity to speak. Just pray that... I'll have the opportunity to speak to people. But at the same time, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful with thanksgiving. Don't just come running up to God and give him your grocery list. It's God Almighty you're coming into the presence. And he's given you that right by virtue of what his son did. You have that right. But you're not recognizing for who he is or what he has done or who you are. So what did Paul say, continuing in verse 5? Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Redeeming the time, let your words be always with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should answer each person. How many times, about the time you closed your mouth, you have thought, why on earth did I let that get out of my mouth? We do it. We all do it. And we need to be thinking, our words should be seasoned with salt, always with grace. Remind me of that, you have permission. <laughs> and if time were to allow, I, he, Paul takes verses 7 through the end of the chapter talking about various people and what they've done, how they have helped him and all of these things. But I'm not going to take the time. And very briefly, look with me in Ephesians. That's where we are in the chronological order. Chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the, might, in the might of his strength. And he then talks about the armor of God and all the things that we have to put together and how we have to resist and what we have to do. And we've heard that so many times for the purpose of what we're doing this morning. I'm going to jump over that part. In verse 18, he says again, Praying at all times with all prayer and petition in the Spirit. And to this end, being on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, as well as on my behalf, that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. How many times now is that that Paul has asked for them to pray for him to have an opportunity? Keep that in mind when you think about me. And then he talks a little more. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Are you getting the idea that while there was some repetition, Paul did not treat each church the same? Even when there was overlap. It was tailored to the character of that local body, that local church. Do I need to tell you that churches, just like individuals, find themselves in different places in the journey of faith? And so what works in one place won't work in another place. Keep that in mind when you go looking. And the next that were written are called the pastoral epistles. First and Second Timothy and Titus. They were both pastors. I would love to dig into them. 
but I'm not for the sake of time. I do commend them to you because just because he was written, writing to pastors doesn't mean you can't get something out of it. Okay? Remember, y'all are called too. And so, the takeaway. One last time. I have some personal admonitions this time. Be faithful. Continue in the Word. Each week for over 11 years, I've tried to give you an example of rightly dividing the Word of Truth. As you go, find a place where they do the same. Wherever you go, don't be a spectator. As we've been discussing in Bible study, get out of the boat. Challenge your comfort zone. Do much for God. God did not allow you to get your age for no reason. Some people have not had that opportunity. You've experienced much. You've learned much. With knowledge comes responsibility. Share what you have learned and continue to learn more. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Lessons for the Journey is recorded during the services of New Journey Church in Midlothian, Virginia, where Dr. Clifton is pastor. If you find these messages helpful, please consider subscribing to the channel and clicking the thumbs up. You may access other messages at the website www.lessonsforthejourney.org. If you would like to contact the ministry, you may do so by contacting mail at lessonsforthejourney.org. Join us again next week, when we will continue learning more, Lessons for the Journey.